check, check. Hey everyone, how's it going? Good. Hell yeah. Can we give a hand for everyone who has put together this fucking amazing conference? Thank you guys so much. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm really excited to, uh, to talk at Hope again. I haven't, haven't been able to do a presentation here since 2016, so it's been a while. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's good to be back. And uh, it's it just it's just good to be back with uh, with with everyone here. I'm 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 really excited to to do this today. So thanks for uh, thanks for showing up. This is like such a cool theater. I, I love this place. It's awesome. Um, all right. So uh, they they say you're always supposed to uh, open up a presentation with a joke. Um, so I apologize for the joke that's about to come. Um, <clears throat> they say there are three types of people in this world: those who understand quantum computing those who do not understand quantum computing, and those who both simultaneously understand quantum computing and do not understand quantum computing. <laughs> uh, so, uh, un unfortunately, I, I have to come clean with you guys. I am one of the third type, right? I, I both do and do not understand quantum computing. And I feel like the more I learn about quantum computing, the less I actually understand sometimes. Um, but uh, m my goal today is, is to, well, before I say what my goal is, let me give you a quick disclaimer at the start of the presentation, which is that I am not an expert on quantum computing or quantum physics or quantum mechanics. In fact, what I don't know about these topics has already filled several libraries. So if I'm not an expert, why am I doing this talk at Hope today? That's a good question. Because a few years ago, I thought I might never be able to use a quantum computer. And now, I already have. So that's the reason. It seems a little ridiculous, but when I, when I first started learning about quantum computing, I thought it was kind of like reading in Wired in like 1998 about how there were going to be nanobots in your bloodstream and they were going to clean everything out. You know what I mean? Kind of like that vaporware idea that was really cool at the time. You know, I thought quantum computing was about as real as those nanobots or flying cars or whatever, right? It was stuff that people were experimenting with, but not something you could actually use in real life. I was wrong. And that's why I decided to do this talk. Because the democratization of quantum computing means that if you want to use a quantum computer today, you can. And that's the coolest part. The reason I wanted to do the talk is not because I know everything about quantum computing. In fact, I know a sliver of a sliver about it, right? But I think I know just about enough to get to the really smart people in this room who know more than me and who will get really excited about some of this stuff and can actually code it and can actually do it. So, you know, some, sometimes, um, sometimes you point people towards things <laughs> instead of actually doing it yourself. And I feel like that's part of what my presentation is designed to do. Because I know how many brilliant people there are at this conference, and I bet that you can do this way better than I can. So I, I wanted to show you that quantum computing is something you can actually achieve today. Uh, and you know, I, I, I want to tell you that you and virtually anyone in the world who wants to learn to code for quantum computers can do it today. And you know what? Most of it is actually free. And we have the open source community to thank for that. There are so many great open source free tools that you can use, SDKs, um, actual, actual quantum computing systems that you can use today uh, that will allow you to interact with this world. So let's go ahead and talk through some of this stuff. It's hard to know where to start with quantum because it is really, really complex, right? Um, so I was kind of thinking, where should I start when talking about quantum computing? Well, sometimes when I start learning about a difficult topic, I, I go to r slash ELI5 to get a quick and easy explanation of what I'm working on. Right? For, for those of you who don't know, ELI5 is a subreddit called Explain Like I'm Five, where, uh, where you get people to explain incredibly complex concepts to you in fairly easy to understand ways. 
And I feel like uh, Schrodinger's cat is the same idea when it comes to quantum computing. It's a thought experiment, so don't worry. Uh, no animals were harmed in the making of this presentation. Um, to illustrate the idea of quantum superposition, there is a, uh, a, a physicist uh, that you can see up here uh, named Erwin Schrodinger, uh, who actually had some of these conversations with Einstein and other, you know, other physicists at the time who he was working with. And he, it, it's kind of strange. The, the story is a little bit <laughs> discombobulated because Schrodinger was actually on the wrong side of this argument at first. Um, everyone kind of thinks of Schrodinger's cat as him sort of justifying superposition. He, he actually was arguing against it, but that's neither here nor there. Um, the, the illustration itself um, was that Schrodinger joked that if you put a radioactive atom inside of a windowless box and then put a cat inside of it and left it there for an hour without any way to observe it, you wouldn't know whether the cat was alive or dead. And because of this, that meant that until the box itself was actually opened, the cat is both alive and dead. Um, you don't know whether the cat is 100% alive or 100% dead until you observe it after opening the box. Right, so that, that's the idea of Schrodinger's cat. And the point of this analogy for Schrodinger was to describe what happens when humans observe something like a quantum particle. Because of the steps that humans need to go through in order to actually observe the behavior of something as small as an electron, um, our observation of the electron itself would actually change its behavior. So just like the cat, right? It's, it's the same idea as Schrodinger's cat. And until we open the box with the electron inside, we don't know where it is. And, and uh, you can see here that, uh, that, that Schrodinger's entire idea here was to describe the idea of observation um, it, and, it and, and how observation can actually have an impact on the experiment itself. And this, this is actually an explanation of the concept of superposition, right? Um, and the idea of superposition is that something can be, in, in the example of Schrodinger's cat, is that the cat is both alive and dead until it is actually observed, right? So you don't know what state the cat is in until it is actually observed. And that actually describes one of the principles of quantum computing and quantum mechanics. That was kind of the, the, the thought experiment that Schrodinger used in order to explain this. So now that we understand the idea of Schrodinger's cat, let's apply that to the concept of quantum computing. So our next topic is quantum computing. What is it and how does it actually function? How does it work? Well, to, to really understand what quantum computing is, let's think about actual classical computing, the computing that we all work with on a daily basis and that we understand. So a traditional computer, right, the ones that we all have in our houses or sometimes here even at the conference, uh, a classical computer or traditional computer will use bits, right? We're all very familiar with the idea of a bit. It's either a zero or a one, right? And computers use zeros and ones to perform calculations. Well, quantum computers are a little bit different since they actually use a data storage method called qubits instead of these bits. Now, a qubit can represent the number zero or one like a bit, but qubits can also be in what's called quantum superposition, which describes their quantum state before they're actually measured. So in this quantum superposition state, a qubit can be both a zero and a one. And the only way to find out whether it's a zero or one is to actually measure it. But we can use that quantum state in order to perform calculations incredibly quickly. And manipulation of that superposition state allows developers to create different algorithms that are able to more quickly and efficiently compute data than traditional classical computers. So, um, Quantum computing, the term quantum computing, describes a computer that uses quantum concepts like superposition and entanglement to perform calculations faster than traditional computers. A qubit can represent the number zero or one, right, like, like we were saying, but it can also be in that superposition state. It can be both a zero and a one. Right now, quantum computers aren't actually general purpose programmable computers, right? They're, they're only designed to solve specific problems. So it's not, like, it's not like quantum computers are going to take over the role of classical computers. 
for most things, at least until we really reach true quantum supremacy, where quantum computers are always more efficient than classical computers, we will still be using both classical and quantum computers for different purposes. So um, quantum computers are better at different problems, like, uh, for instance, factorization, which is a problem that's oftentimes used in encryption. One of the things that uh, you know, this particular conference might be a little bit interested in, right? How can you break some of the most widely used encryption schemes in the world today, like RSA, for example, or elliptic curve cryptography? Well, quantum is really the way you can do that by attacking these problems like factorization. Um, it can also attack something like the traveling salesman problem, which we, we currently work on with classical computers, but because of quantum computing, we can actually uh, solve problems like the traveling salesman problem, where you try to find the shortest possible route across multiple cities or uh, you know, multiple different areas um, in, in some hypothetical problem in a much more efficient and fast way than classical computing. And quantum computers excel at solving these kinds of problems because they're able to use the superposition of qubits to perform vast amounts of calculations almost instantly. This is because they're able to perform calculations based on the probability of an object state before it's actually measured. So think back to the Schrodinger's cat example I just told you about. Remember that you don't know whether the cat is alive or dead until you look in the box. The way quantum computers actually work in involves performing calculations before you look in the box and then opening the box afterward. Let's talk a little bit more about how quantum computers actually function. So IBM actually gives a great example of this on their quantum computing site. And uh, for this to make sense, you, you might want to think back to your high school biology days. So I, I apologize in advance if this conjures up any bad memories. Um, but uh, protein folding is one of the problems that quantum can really take on. And uh, a protein is basically just a long string of amino acids um, th that after you fold them, they become complex shapes and they actually become useful biological machines. So figuring out how proteins will fold is important for biology and medicine. A classical supercomputer might try to fold a protein with brute force. And that, that's, what we, that's what we use it for right now. Uh, you may have heard of the at home project, uh, like SETI at home, where you can search for extraterrestrial intelligence um, through, uh, through kind of grid computing using the idea of multiple computers working together as a supercomputer. Well, uh, they, they also had a project called Folding at Home, which was designed to do this with protein folding, basically just using a bunch of classical computers in order to figure out. Um, all the different uh, methods of, of bending this chemical chain just through pure brute force. Well, a much more efficient way of doing this is to use a quantum computer because as the protein sequences get longer and more complex, the supercomputer itself actually stalls. So a chain of 100 amino acids could theoretically fold in like trillions of different ways, right? And brute forcing that with classical computers is really not very practical. No computer has the working memory to actually be able to handle all the possible combinations of those protein folds. But when we, when we think about quantum computing, it's, it's a lot different. Because in the case of proteins, there are actually quantum algorithms today that can find folding patterns in entirely new and more efficient ways. And that's without going through all of the brute forcing that those classical computers have to do. As quantum hardware continues to scale and grow and these algorithms get more and more advanced, they can also tackle protein folding problems that are too complex for any supercomputer today. So that's the idea kind of behind why we would use quantum computing rather than classical computing to handle some of these very complex computational problems. Let's talk about how quantum computers actually function too. Uh, you'll, you'll use a quantum processing unit or a QPU along with your CPU. But in order to do that, in order to get a functioning QPU, there are a lot of different methods that you have to use in order to build a quantum computer. So let's talk about superfluids first. Um, you probably have a fan or some kind of internal cooling system on your PC at home, right? Well, quantum processors need to be incredibly cold. It's not just keeping them at room temperature, it's actually keeping them at about a hundredth of a degree above absolute zero. So 
quantum computers have to be in incredibly, incredibly cold spaces. And manufacturers of quantum computers use superfluids, which are th th these, uh, these fluids that will actually keep the quantum computers at this degree above absolute zero in order to create something called a superconductor. Because of the incredibly low temperature, electrons can actually move through quantum computers without any resistance at all. So that makes them superconductors. And when electrons pass through superconductors, they match up and they form something called a Cooper pair. So a Cooper pair can carry a charge across insulators through a process called quantum tunneling. And I know this is, this is a little more advanced. You can, you can read up on this uh, online. Unfortunately, it, it's, this, this topic is so complex that it's hard to sort of encapsulate it all within a 50-minute within a, a talk. But um, the, the idea here is basically that you're using these Cooper pairs to be able to carry that charge across these insulators, which kind of act as barriers. Um, and that, that's the process known as quantum tunneling. So if you put two superconductors on either side of one of these insulators, they form something called a Josephson junction. Now, um, as, as we think about this, these Josephson junctions are basically used as the qubits, as the superconducting qubits, right? That's how we get to a qubit, something that can store a zero, a one, or a zero and one at the same time. And the, the, way that, the way that these can actually be controlled, these qubits can be controlled, is you fire microwave photons at the qubits uh, in order to control their behavior. So you can actually get them to hold, you can get them to change, and you can get them to read out different parts of quantum information by firing these microwave photons at the qubits. So it's, it's really crazy. I mean, it sounds like sci-fi, but people are doing it today. That brings us to another topic, which is entanglement. You may have heard of quantum entanglement before. If you haven't, quantum, uh, quantum entanglement is basically an effect that correlates the behavior of two separate things. So let's say that we have two qubits that are entangled, right? Maybe w one qubit is, is in, in a superposition state and a another qubit is also in a superposition state. But a change to one of those qubits will, in, will actually impact the other qubit, right? And so the way that quantum algorithms work is they actually leverage those relationships to find solutions to different complex problems. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about one of those algorithms uh, in just a moment and, and how that operates. And again, the source for this is from the uh, IBM quantum computing site uh, at, uh, at ibm.com slash topic slash quantum computing. So let's next talk about what quantum computing is used for and how you can actually use it. So you can see up here, we have uh, an actual IBM quantum computer. And I, I really wanted to show the pictures of these quantum computers because for some reason, and I, I don't know exactly why this was, I, I, I always thought these things were very theoretical, right? I didn't think that they were something you could use today, but they are. And you know, you, obviously, you know, this, this thing probably costs about $15 million, right? So none of us have the money to do that. But I'll show you how you can actually interact with these quantum computers in just a minute. Think about almost any computational process today. And eventually, with the advancement of different quantum properties, at some point, quantum computing will probably be able to handle a lot of these different use cases. Uh, so InfoSec is one of the most interesting things for, uh, for us to think about, right, at a hacker conference. And I've already mentioned sort of the method of, of breaking asymmetric algorithms like RSA or elliptic, cur uh, elliptic curve cryptography. But there are a lot of other really fascinating ways of making new algorithms that are also quantum resistant. So you can make an algorithm so strong that even a quantum computer can't break it. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But there are another, uh, another, a number of other really interesting use cases as well. Uh, so there are quantum algorithms for things like financial modeling, which are, uh, you know, which are going to be really useful for banks and other financial institutions. Uh, data sorting, which is a great use case, especially if you're working with big data and you're trying to figure out a, a way to optimally sort that data. Quantum computing is one method uh, of, of doing that really efficiently. Another, uh, another really interesting use case is um, 
you know, uh, uh, on the science level, chemical and physics problems uh, can be solved with quantum computing. So the problem is, you know, <laughs> I, I mentioned these quantum computers are like $15 million. Uh, anyone here have $15 million to drop on a quantum computer today? If you do, talk to me after. We'll, 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 have, we'll have a good talk. Um, if you don't, the good news is that you don't need to anymore, right? We're in the era of the cloud where you can actually use quantum computers today without having to buy one, right? You can rent time on one of these quantum computers. In fact, AWS, Microsoft Azure, IBM Cloud all have great methods of being able to interact with quantum computers today. So let's talk a little bit more about quantum computing and some of the cool things that we can do with quantum. All right, as you can see here, this shit is so real that even boring business people care now, right? Uh, you guys heard of Gartner? Gartner is like a boring consulting company for rich people, right? But, um, but Gartner has said, as you can see up here, that they estimate that less than 1% of companies are budgeting for quantum today. By next year, they estimate 20% of organizations will be budgeting for quantum computing projects. So from less than 1% to 20% in like a year. Um, and I, I've, I've seen this myself in the business world. I have talked to multiple companies that are hiring for quantum developers that are looking for people in this space right now. So uh, I, I think Gartner's estimate might be a little bit on the high side. I'm not sure 20% of organizations, but I think if you look at really large institutions, especially banks, especially um, you know, other, uh, other institutions that, that have the funding for this kind of thing, I think it's, it's fairly realistic. I would estimate closer to 10 or 15 percent, but um, that, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of what I'm looking at right now. You can see here also, uh, there are a lot of different kinds of use cases that, that we can think of for quantum. And we'll go over these in a little more detail, but you know, things like machine learning, chemistry, physics, being able to solve manufacturing and logistics problems. There are all kinds of different uh, methods that we can use quantum for. Uh, and, and you, you can see here in this, uh, in this graph, um, pretty much pick your poison, right? Uh, I mentioned protein folding already, but even use cases like autonomous vehicles, um, you know, being able to have, uh, you know, being able to take your Uber without an Uber driver, uh, being able to uh, use these things to come up with uh, new use cases for pharmaceuticals. There are a virtually infinite number of use cases when it comes to what we can use quantum for. And they're still figuring out use cases today. So even though quantum is being used for these very specialized situations at the moment, there are a lot of other possibilities in the future, particularly as we move closer to true quantum supremacy, which I don't really think we've reached yet. Google and IBM have both come out and said, oh yeah, we're, we're at the quantum supremacy place. And then each one of them have sort of, <laughs> have sort of debunked the other's claims. So I'm not really sure we're quite there yet, but I think we will be someday. So let's talk a little bit about uh, cryptography. We're at, we are at a hacker conference after all. Let's talk about hacking quantum or what quantum can actually do to hack. You see here Peter Shore, one of the most brilliant computer scientists and mathematicians in the world. Uh, and he came up with this incredible algorithm called Shore's algorithm. You can see here uh, Shore's algorithm is a polynomial time quantum algorithm for the factoring problem. Classical computers have not been able to develop any kind of polynomial solution to the factoring problem. But Peter Shore proved, which you can actually see on the graph on the right hand side of the screen here, how much more efficient quantum computing can be to, to actually go through the factoring algorithm. So, the, the, so if, if you're not familiar with the factoring problem, the factoring problem is one way to make it difficult for classical computers to find prime factors of very large numbers. When cryptographers were trying to figure out what, crypt, what, what cryptographic algorithms can we actually use to protect data, they had to figure out something that was really difficult, which is what kind of problem is going to be hard for a computer to solve? And the problem that they came up with was the factoring problem. And that, that's basically figuring out the prime factors of very large numbers. So if I gave you a, you know, a, a number like you know, 10 trillion, 500 mil, 500 billion, 300 
million, blah, 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 whatever, right? Trying to figure out what the prime factors are that come up with that number is very difficult for classical computers to do. And that's one of the ways that, especially our asymmetric encryption functions today. RSA uses this factoring problem as a way of making traditional computers too slow at being able to solve this kind of problem to make it efficient enough to actually break the cryptography. Well, Shor's algorithm was brilliant because it uses this extremely efficient method of quantum Fourier transformation and modular exponentiation by repeated squarings of these different numbers to vastly speed up this process. Basically, he makes the computer go really fast, right? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it, and it's, it's really interesting when you actually take a look at sort of the, uh, the, um, the efficiency of a classical algorithm, which is that, uh, that arc in red versus the blue here on, on the screen. You can see that. And, and then the number of digits here is D, right? You can see the classical record in terms of number of operations here is 230 digits. Whereas if you were to use Shor's algorithm on a computer with, with qubits that go beyond the number of qubits that we have on, uh, on quantum computers today, we could be able to very easily break these algorithms. Now, because of hardware constraints, because quantum computing is developing rapidly, but not quite where it will be eventually, Shor's algorithm has not yet broken these, uh, these encryption algorithms, right? So you can still use RSA today. The question is, what do we do when our crypto is broken, right? Today's crypto is going to be pwned at some point. You can see here that, especially when we're talking about asymmetric crypto, um, symmetric crypto is probably going to withstand quantum for the most part. But asymmetric crypto, because of some of the techniques that we use, is probably most at danger here. You can see, because of Shor's algorithm, these quantum machines will be able to break algorithms like RSA and ECC. Actually, it's really interesting because very recently, I, I, was, uh, I was going through the outline for my presentation as I was creating it, and I, I clicked on my, my link to NIST, and I saw it was a dead link. And that's because NIST has actually changed um, the, the algorithms that they've already chosen for this project, even since the time that I originally created the outline for my presentation. So as of uh, July 2nd, just uh, three weeks ago, uh, NIST has actually chosen algorithms that are quantum resistant. That means they're going to be very difficult for even quantum computers to be able to break. So you guess remember when uh, you guys remember when DES was broken by the EFF, like back in the late 90s? If you, if you don't, DES was the old standard for encryption that the US government used to use. A lot of conspiracy-minded people, or even people who aren't so conspiracy-minded, think that NSA probably put an intentional bug into DES to make it easier for them to decrypt, because it was only a 56-bit crypto system. So uh, they came up with AES, which is what we're all using right now to stay connected to the Wi-Fi, right? AES encryption is now the government standard. And they went through a very careful selection process for this um, in, I believe, the early 2000s, where they, they took a bunch of different candidates. One was uh, Reindahl, which is the actual candidate that was chosen for AES. Uh, another one was, uh, I believe, Bruce Schneier's Blowfish algorithm uh, was another. Uh, so this, this process is what NIST does to basically come up with the most secure encryption algorithms going forward. And for these uh, quantum resistant algorithms, they have chosen the crystals Kyber algorithm as the new quantum resistant algorithm. That means even when we have quantum computers, we'll still be able to encrypt our data with something that is quantum safe. Now they also have a number of digital signature related algorithms. Um, the crystals dilithium algorithm is actually related to crystals Kyber. Um, same, I, I believe it's the same developers, um, but uh, they, they use some of the same concepts. Falcon and Sphinx are also being used as the new digital signature quantum resistant algorithms. Uh, and uh, NIST has gone through this very elaborate process to figure out what the best methods of protecting our data will be in a post-quantum world. Now, uh, there are a few other candidates that are currently going through round four of the process. Um, and you can read more on the NIST site about this. I'll have some links in the presentation. But uh, it's good to know that 
the crypto that we're using for the future will eventually be quantum resistant. That said, the current <laughs> encryption algorithms we use are not quantum resistant. So they're going to have problems in the future. Now let's take a look at what problems that might actually cause. You can see here, um, well, let's see, I, I, I believe, oh, you know what, I, I'm sorry, it was on my previous slide, sorry about that. Uh, on the, uh, the right-hand side of the screen here, you can see the, uh, the GitHub for Kyber, which is the general use post-quantum encryption algorithm that uh, NIST has standardized on. You also see on the far right side of the screen here, the NSA Utah Data Center. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you guys have heard about this, but the, the NSA has built an enormous data center in Utah that is uh, storing incredible amounts of data about uh, both Americans and foreign nationals, right? So uh, at some point, if you think about it, people who think they are sending secure data are having that secure data captured that maybe can't be decrypted today. But as soon as NSA gets their hands on one of these quantum computers that's actually able to decrypt something like RSA or ECC, all of a sudden they'll have the keys to the kingdom, right? And data that they've been collecting over years will be able to be compromised. So that's the reason why it's so important to develop these post-quantum algorithms so that even if someone like NSA is able to break uh, crypto, that we can still have a method of securing our data. The great part about these algorithms is, is that they are all open source and open to the public. Uh, thankfully, they aren't classified like the old skipjack <laughs> algorithm or something like that was. So you can actually go through the code, look at how it's functioning, and you can actually see weaknesses in the code, um, which, is, which is a really important part of this. Uh, so uh, I, I think, uh, I think it's, it's important to know how your data is being secured so that you can be confident that even far into the future that you will be able to secure your data. Now let's talk a little bit about what else quantum can do. So there are a number of other different use cases that we can, we can kind of focus on when it comes to quantum. And uh, a couple of those use cases include artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? Uh, there's actually a field called QML, or quantum machine learning, right now, that is already really focused on this problem. And when you start to see things like GPT-3 or DALI, you can see how important AI and ML are going to be going forward. I already mentioned chemistry and physics as two of the, uh, the different use cases here. Um, said being able to study chemical reactions through quantum will be a huge, huge advantage for scientists, as well as physics, right? You can, you can actually, um, you know, especially when it comes to simulating quantum systems, um, being able to use quantum computers to do that will be an invaluable resource. Even things like weather forecasting. I know there are probably some weather nerds in here. Um, the, ha the hacker crowd tends to kind of bring them out. But being able to predict what weather will look like in the future based on being able to compute these incredibly large uh, data sources. We also have a couple of, other, uh, couple of other use cases. I already mentioned finance, right, and how finance may, uh, may work with some of these things. Even, but you, you know, if you want to look at the blockchain, right, there are probably a lot of people here who are interested in that. Now the blockchain uses uh, you know, symmetric cryptography, but there are some blockchain implementations that use asymmetric cryptography. If we have a quantum system and the blockchain is not using quantum safe cryptography, there's a possibility that you can actually break some of this cryptography with quantum computers. Finally, the logistics uh, problem, which I, I believe is going to be a really great use case. I kind of talked about the traveling salesman problem already. But being able to find the most efficient way for goods and services to be delivered uh, is going to be another really great use case for quantum computing. So the question comes, well, all this seems cool, but like, who cares, right? Only, only rich people can get to use these quantum computers right now. I don't have one. I don't have access to one. You know, this stuff seems kind of cool, but like, what's in it for me, right? Well, let me tell you. There are a lot of really great ways that you can actually interact with quantum today. You can see on the right-hand side of the screen, I, ha I, I put a prompt into this cool little AI app. It's kind of similar to something like Dolly, uh, but it's called uh, Wombo Dream. So I, I typed in cyberpunk hacker poning a quantum computer, and that's, uh, that's what it came up with on the right. So that could be you today.
A couple of really cool links, and I put these in the presentation. I'll, I'll give a link to the presentation here at the end. But you can see here, uh, GitHub has a, one of their awesome lists. I don't know if you've ever seen a GitHub awesome list, but it basically is like the best resources for dealing with any problem. And the awesome list is really great for quantum. There are all kinds of really, really cool tools that are mostly free and open source that you can access there. IBM has created this SDK called Kisskit, totally open source. Um, there are some amazing, amazing uh, aspects of it. I, I would like to show you, if we have a little bit of time at the end, I might even get a chance to show you kind of a basic Kisskit use case here. But a uh, couple, uh, couple of other really great uh, projects that you should check out. One is uh, the Quantum Open Source Foundation. They have tons of different dev tools if you're interested in getting into this. Um, and, and these are all tools that you can use for free, right? Uh, the, the really great part about this community is they have open source and made r really free software out of a lot of their tools. So you don't have to pay anything to get involved. Microsoft has created Q Sharp in the Quantum Development Kit, or their QDK. Uh, they have an entire language that they've, that they've created very similar to something like IBM's Kiskit, where you can use the existing programming knowledge you have. Like Kiskit is essentially Python, right? But, but you can import these quantum modules that you can actually use to interact with quantum computers. And Microsoft is also working on a lot of different cool uh, methods of establishing quantum safe algorithms today. So I, I've been playing around a little bit with um, their, their implementation of OpenVPN, but they implement it in a, a way that is safe from quantum. So, even, even if you do have a quantum computer that can, that can attack existing algorithms, um, they have a VPN, uh, a, a quantum safe VPN system that they're building, as well as a quantum safe TLS uh, system for, uh, for certificates. So some, some very cool stuff there. But you know, those are just some tools with kind of working on how to develop for quantum computers. How can I actually get my hands on a quantum computer today? Again, a lot of really good uh, ways of using current cloud computing providers' resources in order to access quantum computing. I use the analogy of this being kind of like having access to a PDP-11 in the 70s, right? That's what, that's what Bill Gates and Paul Allen did, right? They, they were able to get timeshare access on one of these enormous machines that took up a whole room. It's not, like, it's not like Gates and Allen could have actually bought one of those computers, no. Instead, they bought timeshare rights on them. And current quantum computers are much like that, right? We have the same idea here. So you are essentially getting timeshare access to the next wave. And you can do that through systems that you are probably already really familiar with. How many of us have worked with AWS or Azure in the past? Yeah, I see tons of hands going up, right? These are very familiar systems, and you can use tools in AWS and Azure today in order to access real quantum computers. It's super cool. So AWS has uh, their bracket system that you can use to access uh, really, really uh, incredibly fast quantum computers. Sometimes you'll have to wait for a few hours or whatever to get the quantum computer to do, its, to do the job for you. I actually wanted to do a live demo, but unfortunately just because of the amount of time that we had, <laughs> a lot of the times those quantum computers aren't available for a few hours or something. It's kind of like when you were working on a PDP-11, you had to wait your turn for the computer to actually do what you wanted to do. But you, you can put yourself in the queue and after a few hours have your quantum code run by a real quantum computer. And a lot of the time, like in, in AWS Bracket or something, it costs like 30 cents per job or something. And just like regular AWS boxes, you don't want to leave that box just running <laughs> indefinitely because then the, you know, the, the charges start to, to build up. But if you want to run single jobs with quantum, you can actually do that right now. Or alternatively, if, if you want to keep it free, you can run them in a quantum simulator, right? And, and be able to figure out how it would operate on a real quantum computer. But you don't have to use a quantum simulator today. You can actually use a real quantum computer to do this. We've got some other systems up here, Azure Quantum, like I mentioned. The IBM Q experience. IBM is really, uh, really digging their heels in when, when it comes to uh, being able to uh, create some pretty impressive quantum systems. They're, they're, doing, they're going about this in the right way. Kiskit is a great system to be able to develop in. 
Google's quantum AI, super cool stuff. TensorFlow, if any of you have worked with that before, is kind of key to that Google AI. Uh, so definitely recommend checking that out. And then IonQ, who are one of the main computer manufacturers working in the quantum space right now. Let's talk a little bit more about just how to get involved in the quantum community, because this stuff is hard. It's really complicated. Like, I, uh, I have no idea how 99.9% .9 of it works, to be honest. The main point of this presentation is to get you involved, because I know there are people who are way smarter than me at this conference, and I think that the more we focus on this stuff as a community, the deeper into quantum we can get, and the cooler shit that we can make. So, a um, couple, uh, couple of really good places to check out. You want to check out Unitary Fund. They're, they're this nonprofit that's been put together by a bunch of companies to help spread the message of quantum and to really try to democratize quantum and get this to as many people as we can. Uh, they have a website which is just unitary.fund and then their Discord is discord.unitary.fund. Quantum.info is another great place. If you want to go to conferences kind of like Hope but that are, that are really revolving around quantum in this new space, check out quantum.info. Quantum of Palooza is another list of free quantum training and conferences, another really good resource if you're trying to get involved with the community. If you want to learn more about this stuff from way smarter people than me, great place to go. And finally, the Quantum Computing subreddit, really good place for information. You can kind of just talk to people a little more casually there. It's just r slash quantum computing. And uh, honestly, that's pretty much it. Um, if you want to uh, troll me, you can uh, hit me up on uh, any of these different services. Um, there's also a, a, uh, a copy of the presentation slides. I promise it is malware-free. <laughs> it will reflect on me very badly if it weren't, but it's just tinyurl.com slash quantumcomputinghope. Um, so you can go to that if you're interested in getting these slides um, and seeing some more of the links. The final, uh, the final page of the presentation it's just a whole bunch of links. I was hoping to get to show you guys some of this stuff, but I'm too long-winded and ran out of time. So um, I, want to, uh, I want to open it up to any questions. Uh, thank you guys so much for, for listening to the talk. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, any, uh, any questions or, or thoughts about this stuff? And, I may or may not be able to answer these questions, just so you know. Like I said, I am not an expert in this stuff, uh, so I may have to refer you to, to someone else or somewhere else, but glad to, glad to take any questions if anyone has any. I can, definitely. I was actually going to do that on the Kiss Kit side. Absolutely. If anyone have questions, I have a microphone, so just raise your hand. Give me one second here. Let's see. Uh, can I get the uh, can I get the screen back up, please? Thank you. Whoops. Hold on. Awesome. Thanks very much. You're doing a great job on the on the screen. Thank you. It's it's been killer. All right. So here's here's a quick intro to Qiskit, which is the uh, which is the SDK that IBM has created for quantum computing. And you can see here, this is kind of an intro for, uh, for the way that the, uh, the user workflow operates. Let me scroll down a little bit so you can actually see the code here. And there are links to all of these things within the presentation. Again, that's just uh, tinyurl.com slash quantumcomputinghope. You can see here, this is, all, this is all Python code, right? And that's like the coolest part is, is you can use, you can stand on the shoulder of <laughs> shoulders of giants and you can use the, uh, the knowledge that you already have about how to hack Python in order to do this stuff. So this is, a, this is an example of uh, the different workflow. Uh, this, this, this is sort of the whole example. So let me, let me scroll down a little bit. Um, you can import the different packages that are needed for your app. So you can, uh, you, you can just do standard, standard Python importing here. Um, but you're also going to be importing uh, you know, quantum circuit, uh, chasm simulator, and uh, being able to plot the histogram of the actual quantum circuits that you're simulating. Um, 
then you will initialize variables, right? So you can create a quantum circuit. Here, all you have to do is type in circuit equals quantum circuit, parenthesis, two, comma, two, end parenthesis, and you can initialize two qubits in the zero state, right, with, with two of the classical bits set to zero. Really, really cool stuff. Um, I know I'm kind of, I'm running out of time a little bit. I just want to show you a couple more quick things. You can add different gates to actually manipulate registers of the circuit. So this is where you can actually interact with the circuit itself um, is, by, is by using these different operations to, to, uh, create, um, to create Hadamard gates, right, which is one of the ways that quantum computing actually functions. And then you can even visualize the circuit and get kind of a physical representation of, or a I should say a logical representation of what the, uh, what the circuit looks like. Finally, you can actually perform a simulation of the experiment, or you can actually run this live code on real quantum computers. Uh, now, there is a very small cost associated with that most of the time, depending on what system you're using. If you're using something like Bracket, there is, you know, there is a, a fee of, like I said, I think it's like 30, 50 cents, something like that. But uh, uh, that, that's, that's kind of the idea behind how this stuff actually works in the cloud. Um, you can, and then you can actually perform a visualization of the results. So you can see here, you actually get a histogram of uh, the probabilities here um, based on, based on the, uh, the, the, different, uh, the different counts. So that, that's a quick, uh, quick little tutorial of how some of the code works. I promise if you go online and look at it, you'll get a much more in-depth explanation than I can offer here, but totally worth checking out the resources. Um, I, can, uh, I can go ahead and throw the uh, throw the presentation thing back on the screen. Hold on one sec. One second here, guys. Sorry. There we go. Uh, so this is the link to all the uh, all the different resources that I was mentioning here. Just go to tinyurl.com/quantumcomputinghope. You'll have links to all those different resources. Um, links to uh, the IBM site, the AWS site, Azure, and uh, all of the other quantum community resources. So what I would advise you to is get involved in this stuff. It's super cool. You can hack it today. This is not just sci-fi anymore. It's not just something that's going to happen in the future. You can work with quantum computers today. And that's the point of my talk. So thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate it.